Lender is a global events company that started as Rebecca Lender's vision for a new kind of event management company, one that moved beyond event production to provide creative strategy, knowledge, and leadership to turn an event blueprint into inspirational reality for each client. Learn more about Lender Global Events at lenderglobal.com. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here's your host, BizBash chairman and founder, David Adler. We are so pleased to have Chris Karate, the VP of Communications for the Washington Post, for her second appearance on Gather Geeks. In her dual role running communications and events, she has been a pioneer in moving the Jeff Bezos-owned Washington Post successfully into the revenue-producing live events arena. Even before the virus, Karate had a hybrid strategy that included digital that has really paid off today. Doing three to four events a week, they are attracting 50,000 to 75,000 viewers and even up to 600,000 viewers for some events. In today's conversation, she will share some of the best practices that have been developed even in the short two months of this new world. She discusses everything from the power of great lighting and sound to the nuts and bolts of content creation, marketing, and partnership with speakers to promote events. Let's take a listen. But the idea is how do you inspire others to not look at this as the end of the world, but the beginning of the world? (laughs) You know, to take a step back, and this is something that you and I had talked about, I think, gosh, last summer, there are probably a million ways to approach the events business, right? And I think that you saw that with the live events and how companies approached it. And I've always said that um, there's no one size fits all solution and that the best thing you can do is look at your individual business and figure out what types of events and what approach actually makes sense for your brand and for your business. So for the Washington Post, I've always looked at this as a really important extension of our news brand. So the way that we've always approached these is um, starting with the content and making sure that we have this world-class content and then convening people to experience that that reporting unfolding live. Uh, And when this happened, you know, we really took the time. We, you know, we took a couple of weeks to really think about what do we want to achieve if we move to all virtual events, right? I think a lot of people were questioning, okay, you know, if they sold tickets, how do they replicate? Or if they, they just wanted to get up and running. So they just, you know, use Zoom or whatever it might be. And, and we took, we took some time to say what's important to us as a brand and what what do we want to continue to get out of a quote unquote an events business right in this kind of uh, space we realized that we needed to make sure that it was very high level guests that we needed these to be um, the kind of newsmakers that people might not see everywhere we wanted to make sure that we had a really great technology solution so that if people were watching it, they could see video elements or graphic elements or have our lower thirds that help them understand who it is that they're seeing if they're if they're joining us late. Um, and so we built this sort of hybrid system. We went and pulled some equipment out of our control rooms and uh, figured out the best way to do that. But I think, um, you know, I would say I'm really pleased with what we've done, but I think there's still a lot of evolving to do. Tell us where you are now. How many people are viewing it? What is the format? How do you explain it to a potential sponsor? And sort of what was important to you when you had those meetings for those two weeks? Where we are now is uh, we have really four to five programs a week. And we've really tried right now to focus it, you know, for the last, what would this be now, two months, uh, we've really tried to focus it on sort of the the government leaders who are leading the response in the pandemic, right? Because we're, we're taking a, a real news tack here. So that's something that we're bringing on um, governors who are on the front lines, people on um, the White House task forces, um, and then looking at CEOs of major industries and what they're facing and how they're looking at this. And um, 
And I think that that's served us well because I think audiences want to hear from these folks, the folks who are actually, you know, on, on a large scale problem solving, right? We're all individually trying to problem solve in our in our lives, but I think there's some real interest in on a larger scale how people are approaching this. And so um, we've managed to find ways to both have our broad reach audience. And David, you'll remember, I talked to you about my audience strategy last summer, which yeah. always included digital, right? Yeah. We always made sure we were on all the platforms because for me, that was valuable. It's valuable to have both that, broad reach, you know, big numbers of eyeballs and that intimate reach with with the people who care deeply about that particular topic. So we've found we've we've started to solve for ways to get that intimacy. But certainly from a broad reach perspective, you know, our programs range anywhere from 50,000 to 150,000 people watching live. Um, and and actually, we had a program uh, early on that went over 600,000 people watching live. Would you say that that, I mean, it, that's enormous. I mean, that Even in today's numbers, that's enormous, especially consistently doing that. Right. I think, you know, consistently we're ranging about 50 to 75,000 people. And the reason we do that, right, is we don't set it and forget it. You know, we do a lot of work to promote it, make sure people know about it. We um, take sort of a very, a, a page from an early post strategy playbook, which is, you know, go where the people are, be where they're, where they're consuming this kind of thing, where they're watching videos, where they're looking for news video and make sure that we're there. So, you know, we're streaming live from our homepage, of course, but on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, we're promoting these socially. And then we're doing a lot of direct outreach um, to the, we call them sort of the business decision maker audience across the country uh, to make sure that we're really taking advantage of the fact that, you know, no longer do people have to um, sort of think about this as coming in person wherever we are, even though we people could always watch wherever they are. We're really trying to, to rethink how we invite people in. And that's really taken a much more uh, national and frankly, international approach. How are you partnering with your speakers to get audience? Are they uh, participating in this? It seems like they would want to. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the wonderful thing about digital, right? Is that, um, you know, they can be sharing these things. We are, we're, we live clip um, shorter sound bites on Twitter. So they're very easily shareable from, um, you know, our speakers, staffs can share them. And the, we try to make sure that we're working in as much of this social DNA as we can. And I think, I, frankly, I think there's more that we can do. That's why I say we always like to evolve and think about what's next. But that's that's a big part of it, right, is being able to share and invite people in. But it sounds like the beginning, the end of the event is just the beginning of the event so uh, in terms of, which I noticed that, you know, when you work with people that are working all night to promote the things that you had on, it actually increases it for next time because you got the FOMO aspects of it. Well, let's hope, right? That's that's the idea. I think we do a lot of um, marketing and, and invitation outreach in advance, but afterwards you've got the long tail of this thing. And, and you and I have always talked about the fact that, you know, if, you, if you're just thinking about that in-room piece of it, you're missing a whole world of opportunity from a brand perspective. So we've got our you know, video clips that are going up. We're we're pushing these to news organizations, so you'll see um, other broadcast outlets or other news publishers. You know, writing from our interviews, which I think, as a news entity, that's a big goal, right? Yeah, that's, the whole, that's the holy grail for, 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 us, for, exactly. for everybody. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, but is, it seems like you've been do you've been getting news on almost every one you've done. I mean, you, you're like you're definitely hitting more than you're missing in terms of making news. Right, absolutely. And you know, what's really opened up for us in this setting is that the guests don't have to worry about traveling to a specific location. We can get them anywhere and at a time that makes sense for them when they can sit down in front of their computer and have this conversation with one of our reporters. And that has, um, has really been a huge opportunity to get 
names in that we haven't necessarily worked with before. It's also meant that from a geographic standpoint, there's this huge diversification. So you end up seeing local affiliates in the heartland picking up parts of our interviews or writing from our interviews. And I think that that's really exciting development too. Well, you're using a lot of television techniques for guest um, recruitment, it seems like, and you're being much more strategic about it as opposed to, okay, here's the big name, we got him, but is he been everywhere? I mean, it, it sounds like you're, is that kind of your thinking on this too? Absolutely. I think we're trying to find those slots that, um, that haven't been talked to death. But I also think that, you know, when you're, especially in, in a time of sort of uh, a big news story that everyone's experiencing together and you're trying to get leaders within that, there are going to be people that you get who have done other interviews. But I have this incredible editorial staff who pulls all of that research, sees what's been said, what's been covered, and sort of, um, and builds these questions that can take the conversation to a, to a next level. And that's the idea is to sort of make some news because that's what people want to watch. That's why people want to watch our reporters, right? Because they feel like they're watching that news making process happen in real time. How, how has this changed in terms of pre-COVID? The newsroom was always a little more skeptical of these kind of things. Now they seem like they're completely on board. Have you seen the shift? You know, I, I have to be honest, I, I, I saw the shift before this happened. Uh, but I do think that that the opportunity that this has opened up in terms of um, the types of, of speakers we're able to bring in, the types of guests, has really excited um, the newsroom. And I think that they also have seen the fact over, and this is over the course of the last couple of years, right, that this is a true news platform and that when our reporters come to do this, we always tell them, your job is to do your job. These are not, um, you know, they're not gotcha interviews, they're conversations, but they're not fluffy conversations, right? The, the point is for these to be reporters acting like reporters. And that's why I always go back to, for events, you have to map back to what makes sense for your brand. And that's what makes sense for us. And how do you, what's your revenue model on these? I mean, is there a revenue model on these for now? It seems like it will be if there's not one now. <laughs> yes, there is still a sponsorship model for us. And I think that that, um, you know, that's actually been a really interesting thing for us to work through is we have um, sponsors who have come on specific to the now and we've been able to, um, you know, be really creative about how we work in video assets or things like that. And then we have uh, sort of pre-COVID sponsors that we are converting to these virtual events and thinking about how we can bring to life the original vision for their participation in a way that makes sense for this model. Because look, when you're asking people to come in person, they're, they're, they're expecting to devote a segment of their time, right? One to two hours. I mean, for some people, right? They do day long events. For us, when we, when we went digital, we also recognized that in a virtual world, people aren't necessarily going to sit on their computer for two hours, right? And watch. So we've, um, we've shortened these interviews so that they feel really native to the platform that we're, that our dominant platform, right? And right now our dominant platform is, is purely digital. And so we've, we've shortened those and we've um, worked with our sponsors to talk with them about how to really be effective messengers within that format. And how, what is that effective way to do it? So for other sponsors who are listening, how do you to be appropriate Right. I think, there's, I think there's a couple ways. I mean, I, uh, my, my, you know, my, my personal preference uh, is uh, when we've worked with sponsors who have, you know, really wonderful video assets, because I think there's something exciting about the visual opportunity of storytelling within this format. So when we can run something <laughs> that feels like a commercial, um, but is beautifully produced and, you know, you have this real opportunity in this format to, to do something like that. And we've, uh, we've seen some of our sponsors 
take that approach. And then the other thing is um, revisiting this idea of a sponsored segment within our program. And um, we have some uh, coming up that I think will be really exciting, but it's really getting them to think about this shorter, tighter format, really making sure it's as lively and feels newsy um, so that it fits within the scope of what the Washington Post is producing. What is this the length now that you think is appropriate for digital consumption of, and, a, of a show, entire show? An entire show, I'd say, um, you know, right now we've been running no more than like 20 to 45 minutes. I think that Depending on the topic, if we were doing a deep dive into something, you know, we could maybe stretch it as long as an hour, but I've been trying to cap it at about 45 minutes. And if we have uh, one interview, we try not to exceed 20 to 30 minutes. We feel like uh, we can capture people's attention for about that long. I think it's a nice length for the guest and for our host to try to sustain the conversation when it's all virtual. Uh, and um, I think when we do sort of deeper dives into topics, which we'll be taking on in the next couple of months, we'll probably go more towards the 45 minute end. But we were really trying to think about um you know, what makes sense for for the format that we're in? You know, when you're in person, people expect to come to vote a couple hours of their day or longer in some cases. And I think that um, that's, you know, in this format, that's not necessarily going to be the best experience for people. Yeah. Do, do you find that it falls off when you do your analysis? Is it, do you get your peak? When do you get your peak audiences? Is it Let's, the beginning, the middle, or the end? <laughs> it's actually it's actually throughout. I think we target a start time so that people can feel like they're joining live. But when I'm watching, I'm watching the engagement. You can see it, um, you know, ebb and flow throughout. We usually have a pretty consistent number of viewers throughout. Um, but I think that's also the nice thing about digital events is people can feel like, oh, I missed the start, but it's not like I forgot to get in my car and drive there, right? They can still jump on and, and join us um, partway through. And we try to build the format so that it's very easy for them to, to dip in. And does it, um, does it matter the time of the day that you start? Have you done any analysis of, of the best times for these? Yes. So, you know, when we were doing these in person, we were always targeting this idea that we wanted to catch people on their way to work because, you know, it, it, it's the easiest time of day to say, I'm going to go into work just a little bit late to catch this event in person. Um, and so for the most part, that was a lot of what we focused on in the in the in room. But what we what we've really looked at here is peak usage times online? When are people really on their computers? And we've found that that 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. range is really great. People are online. We try to avoid that sort of true middle point where people are feeding their kids lunch because people have their kids at home. Uh, but that's really a peak time that we've seen people online. And I mean, obviously we do other times, we do early afternoon, we've done mornings, but um, if we sort of had our choice, that's where we see the highest uh, viewership. How, how about, have you seen any patterns of what, what people are doing during a week period? What day is better now? Because you know, everything is upside down, so nobody really knows anything. Right. You have experience. Yeah. That's a really good question. I mean, I think if, if what you're asking is, you know, are Saturdays the same as Tuesdays? I don't think so. I think, um, I think especially when we are looking at our site traffic, um, you know, I do think people still work during the week and try to take weekends. Um, and if, if I see something different, we'd certainly experiment with that. But I think for right now, it's the same reason why, you know, I'm not necessarily going to do an event at eight at night. You know, people aren't necessarily, they've been <laughs> staring at their computer all day, maybe sitting in a home office like me in a cramped room um, and feeling like they want to do anything but sit on the computer and stare at a screen for another hour. A leading events agency based in DC, Linder has a global footprint. 
Since their founding in 1996, they have partnered with internationally recognized clients such as the Smithsonian Institute and the iconic National Cherry Blossom Festival to produce and manage innovative and experimental events that don't just engage, they inspire. To learn more about Linder Global events, visit linderglobal.com. What about the, um, the people that are tuning in afterwards? Are you noticing uh, any numbers there that are substantial in terms of the replay? Well, so those numbers for us have always been substantial, right? We've always had, you know, tens of thousands of people watch the clips and engage with us after the fact. In, in fact, you know, I'm talking to um, a king of podcasting, but we have, you know, for a long time converted every uh, event into a podcast. And I, and I always say, you know, sometimes we just do these things thinking, you know, strategically down the road, we'll do more with them. And we've been so busy that our promotional firepower is around the, the video. But what I've found is even without promoting the podcast, thousands of people find them every week, which is mind blowing to me because they're absolutely hidden. Um, but people are finding them and listening to them. So I think there's a lot of a lot of room for viewership of these long beyond that live space. Have you developed any stars in terms of the interviewers that uh, the reporters that have really shined now based in this new format? Or are you still using the same people that you used before? David, you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> we love all your children. <laughs> exactly. But are right. you noticing? Are you noticing people that are really like, man, I love this. I mean, the people that were sort of these print reporter guys that all of a sudden um, we've seen that in our television stars for sure on the chat shows and the morning shows and things like that. But you're you've got to be developing lots of talent to make this work right. Right. Absolutely. Well, I think that was true um, in room, you know, being a moderator, being an anchor of a show is not easy, especially oh, yeah. when especially when it's not just um, sort of ongoing conversation like you might see on a cable network. These are intended to really be, you know, one big shot news interview. And so it takes a lot of preparation, a lot of research. It also takes, you know, the ability to let your um, your personality shine through. And that's I, I don't mean to say in a a goofy way or an undercutting way, but to bring some, you know, charisma to the screen. And we've certainly seen um, some of our stars be able to do that and really, you know, shine in this digital format, which is, you know, great for us in the long term. It is in when you interview someone on a digital platform. I know that when in podcasting, we interrupt a lot more than we would normally do because people will go on. Do you use? Do, do you train the people to? sort of the people that are the interviewers to um, engage a little bit more aggressively rather than just let someone talk? Or do you just let them talk? I mean, how do you, is there a style that works better? I'm trying to see when other people are doing this, what approach they should get. I mean, when you see a panel and sometimes they drone on and on and on, you want to like <laughs> the throat? <Right. laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's, I think that's a good question. You know, for us, um, you know, we do talk a lot with the reporters about, I actually, you know, coach them to make sure that they let people finish a thought, but not be afraid to jump in and, and question or, um, you know, push or, you know, if someone has gone on too long or they feel like they're sort of lost in a thought to, to bring them back with that next question. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't say that we necessarily say, be more aggressive in this digital format. Um, you know, I, I think that the idea is that they're asking really um, in-depth questions. And I think in some ways they expect to get relatively in-depth answers. But you do see in the format of the shows, the way our producers work with our moderators, that you'll have questions where they know the answers will probably be longer. And then you I'll hear the executive producer be like, he's in a short round of questions where you know the answers will be shorter. So I think it's also in the prep work to understand what what the flow f is should feel like and the moderators can sort of uh, uh, work from there. So it brings up an interesting point. How do you manage these things? Are you, are you operating like a television production or are you operating like an event group? Or have you changed how – are you sitting in the, in the, in the production uh, in, with headsets on and thinking about what's going on? And what do you do at these events as the person that's sort of in charge ultimately? 
Right. Well, it's a, it's a fabulous hybrid. And I, I hope that we always think about it that way. Um, because I think that there's still a lot of value in having an event mindset, right? When you have, um, I mean, look, I use the cable nets as an example, and they do a ton of promotion and commercial work, right? I mean, they're, they're marketing machines. However, in some, some senses, you've got 24 hour programming and you're not necessarily, um, deeply promoting and pushing people to every single hour throughout that day. And so for us, while I want visually to feel like a television broadcast, because I think it feels good to people watching, um, I want, I want the content to be really sharp. And I also want us to apply that event mindset to make sure we're driving people to it, that we're thinking about how to make the most of it, that we're giving it those long legs. I um, mean, we have the the luxury of doing that because we aren't filling, you know, eight hours of programming during the day. How do you how do you then allow the audience to participate in ways that may not just be on the screen? But uh, like I noticed when we do these Zooms, half the people are on the chat side, not paying any attention to what's going on on the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> what what are you doing to engage the audience other than the content or is that the most important part anyway well so this is the this is a million dollar question to me and it's something that we think about all the time you know right now a lot of the engagement is happening on the social side it's happening in the direct outreach side we're soliciting questions we're thinking about you know other ways that we can engage the audience and then you know within the broadcast we try to weave that in uh, I think that there is frankly more that we can do. I think uh, for us, again, we have to start with the core of what was, what was critical and what did we want to make sure we got out the door that we felt really proud of. And then I think from there, the most important thing is that we don't sit still and uh, how we engage people is, is certainly top of mind for me. Um, Last part of this, you know, you're working from home. How do you manage a team to produce a regular, you know, two or three times a week sometimes, how do you do this? How do, how do you, what, how do you staff this? How do you keep people motivated? How do you, you know, we used to have, you know, management by walking around. How do you do this from this beautiful uh, room that you're in right now? Talking to me? <laughs> um, well, I think the most important thing is trying to maintain that team atmosphere. So we do uh, team standups every morning at 10 a.m. We, you know, we have our little Brady Bunch Zoom call so everyone can see each other and um, participate. And, you know, we have smaller versions of that throughout the day with the various segments of teams. Uh, I think that the, the regular communication and taking advantage of the ability to see each other and not just do phone calls has been really important. And then, um, you know, I, I'm very fortunate to have an incredibly talented team. Uh, and, you know, this team really single-handedly developed our technology solution um, and has built a virtual control room so that, you know, we do, you you know, if you, if you log into our virtual control room, you can see, you know, our, our AV folks, our EP, you can hear them calling the show. It feels very lively. And I think that also helps the team. So this is nothing off the shelf. This is like stuff that you guys developed internally uh, yes. to operate. Yes. I think that, you know, there were a few things we wanted to solve for, right? Bringing guests in and out, rolling video, running graphics, having lower thirds, being able to control all of the branding and backdrops. And, um, you know, after a lot of testing and trial and error, we settled on um, sort of a hybrid of, you know, existing technologies and then um, sort of hard equipment that we went and pulled out of our actual live control room. And does everyone have a camera at home pretty much to do, to do the professional side of this? Uh, the, is that everyone's operating from home, right? There's no one going to the post. Exactly. And so what we've done is we've built um, what I call sort of 
moderator packages that we send to their homes that include things like a proper lapel mic and, you know, a better camera and an IFB and and ways that they can, um, you know, be able to do these interviews without having to have earbuds in or so that it, it looks and feels like they're sitting in an anchor chair, even though they're in their living room. And the guest as well gets the same um, structure or do you depend on what they have in their own home? Well, we depend on what they have in their own home because a lot of these are, you know, booked based on their schedules and we're, you know, doing four or five new people every week. This equipment, as you can imagine, with everyone being home is not easy to come by. Uh, But the team does make sure, you know, I think uh, some of our guests, um, roll their eyes because we insist on checking their connections in advance of the of the broadcast so that we can help them troubleshoot a bad connection because you'd be surprised um how bad some of these inter- internet connections can be especially oh. if you've got multiple people on devices and uh and, and that is actually um that is something that we've had to troubleshoot yeah especially when you're in your country home and you're in the middle of nowhere like my internet is awful here where i am can i uh, be in your country home i just want to be in your country home oh it's my country home <laughs> it's, it's if it wasn't a pandemic this would be fantastic um d- d- what about lighting i mean i'm noticing i'm watching you on uh squadcast right now and your lighting is fantastic are you i mean what is the most important element that you as the end producer the ultimate re- person responsible says, oh, we got to change that. Is, is it lighting? Is it sound? Is it like you're looking at, instead of F and B now, you're dealing <laughs> with uh, the details. So we've always talked about how details are critical. Yeah. What are the details that you look for in a good virtual digital production? You hit on The, the number one three. The, okay, so I would say um, internet speed, sound, lighting. Right. If you're talking about from a technical perspective, I mean, obviously the the prep and the content is critical. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I, you know, it's funny you mentioned the lighting. I uh, my other hat is as our our VP of communications, and I have this incredible PR team who, in the very beginning of the pandemic, <laughs> looked at my shot and they said, "You cannot represent us like that." <laughs> so they had me buy a ring light. And now everyone says, oh, your lighting's so great. It's just this silly ring light that I stick on. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I had one in New York, but I got stuck out of New York. So I have to go buy a whole new <laughs> <ring> light. <laughs> it's great. And then, you know, I tell yeah. people, and then I like melt down if I turn it off, right? Because then you yeah. see all the flaws. You know what else? I, I want, you know, One thing I've noticed on these Zoom calls and things like that, people forget to like shave and like pretend that they're like, are they wearing pants or something? You know? <laughs> it's really interesting to watch uh, people. I'm like today, I kind of was a little late, so I just jumped on <laughs> and, and people think that's acceptable now, but it really isn't. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, I put on this, this sweater just for you today, but yeah, thank I mean, you. you're wearing yoga pants. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> So I know that you are constantly thinking about what's next, and this is a complete new world of two months. Where do you see what you're doing in the next two months based on what you've learned to date and what you want to change? Oh, gosh. And this is no good answer to this because nobody knows. Right. I mean, I think um, I think I go back to the fact that, you know, At the Washington Post overall, and you'll hear Fred Ryan say this, you'll hear Jeff say this, which is we need to be constantly experimenting. And when you experiment, you very quickly realize what doesn't work and you cut that out, right? You you pull it back and you find the positive surprises or you find what does work and you double down on them. And so I think that um, right now we're in that period where you know, we're finding the new rhythm of what this means to produce, you know, five events a week. And I think that people think, oh, it's virtual. You kind of throw it up. You have the conversation. But but from a content perspective, it is as intensive as it was with in-person events. You have a different set of logistics, but a lot of the work remains. So, Right now, I'd say the team is figuring out the new, you know, the new metabolism and how to really uh, run those trains efficiently. And then from there, we double down 
uh, we add programming or we shift programming or we figure out that engagement question. And so that's that's where I, I feel like we're looking over the next two months is, you know, what's truly sustainable, what's good for the brand, and then where can we add? You know, I got off the phone uh, just before this um interview with uh, a friend of mine who's a, a genius in my opinion and he says the one thing that we're missing is there's so much content out there but what we have lost was the ability to create serendipity mm-hmm. because digitally it's hard to do that and he says that's the next frontier it's how do you create these gatherings but then connect people in ways that are not planned and right. there is no i don't know the great right answer to that at all but i think that that's what we're missing I agree with him. What do you think? Does that make sense? I 100% agree. I have a a germ of an idea that's starting to grow in the back of my mind. I'm not ready to share it yet. But there are some things that I think we're going to try in the next month or two in an attempt to get at that and to see Mm -hmm. what works. Mm -hmm and what doesn't. So right. you know, I, I do think that we'll be adding some things in addition to the, the truly public facing, you know, broad reach programming, sort of like what things can we add within that, that create that feeling of convening, that feeling of serendipity, of that conversation that could go anywhere or hearing from someone you didn't expect. I, I absolutely think, I think that's really important. I was I was blown away by that concept. I think it's 100 percent right, especially in our world that we've got to create that. We talk about creating intimacy. How do you create that intimacy and the idea that you're connecting in ways that are just not one way, too? Right. Um, absolutely. And we're going to and I think it's, uh, it's going to be death. Zoom is going to be death by PowerPoint at some point. We're going to be so sick <laughs> of. You know, it, 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 it's good now because it's kind of the medium is the message type of thing. And then we're going to go beyond way beyond that. Uh, last question I have is like when you have guests, nobody really knows what's going on. You know, the scientists don't really know. The leaders don't know. How do they project? You see when they don't project the confidence that, that they don't really know or are people saying when they're on these shows that they are experts? I mean, how do you be an expert in an area like today? to communicate something that may or may not be right. I mean, it's, I guess it's the job of the journalist to ferret that out. I think that's why we're so well positioned to have these conversations because when you have these world-class reporters talking with people who really, I mean, who really are on the front lines, I think that, um, you know, they're seeing these things close up. So while they may not have all the answers and we don't assume or present that they have all the answers. There's able to be a real dialogue. And I think, I think that's the difference. It's not a Q and a session where we ask you a question and you give us the definitive answer. It's, it's a conversation. And while we think of it as reporting and reporting out a story, uh, I don't think that, that, that we ever present it as these folks have the ultimate answers. They certainly have a lot of ideas and a lot of great information. And I think that's the important thing um, for our reporters to bring to bear. I guess it's about unscriptedness is really critical mm-hmm. that in this. I mean, in, in this kind of communications, you can't have a tight script because people will just glaze over. So it sounds like you're, you're also experimenting in that world as well. Right. Absolutely. I think that's so important. You know, people could sit and watch a scripted video. That's not right. the business that we're in. Yeah, I was just on a, on a webinar recently where they made everyone record their information to send in. And it was the flattest thing I've ever seen in my life. Right. Because it's the dyna- dynamism of the unexpected is what people seem to be wanting when they're, they want to see something live. And with, you know, it still comes down to trust. I mean, isn't trust the holy grail in this whole thing? And that your trusted brand and your trusted product is going to be what will ultimately, you know, with all the all of the hoo-hahs, it's still about trust and, and, and the mission. Yeah, I think we're seeing that, you know, across our, you know, across our platforms. I think the, the newsroom is seeing that. I think that, you know, the Washington Post is certainly seeing that. I think in times of, of breaking news, you always see people flock to trusted sources. And, you know, whether they say publicly they love the post or not, you know, we have people 
across the country, around the world who come to us because they know at the end of the day, we're going to vet the information. We're going to ask the tough questions. And I think, um, you know, I think that's, that's the great part of being at the Washington Post, period. Right. So the last question I want to ask is, you've been through this, I talked about that it's like we're going through an outward bound course uh, in this, uh, in, in, in what we've been doing. What have you learned in the last two months that surprised either how you changed what you do or how did you get over the fear of this? You have personal a risk in every day in what we're doing. You have children. How did you change over the last two months? Me personally or personally, I, personally, personally, oh gosh. Well, you know, I will, I will give you a personal moment, David, and say that I have a, a five-year-old and a one-year-old at home and I have a five-year-old who is um, smart and sensitive and dealing with uh, how to communicate it with her. You know, she's um, incredibly afraid to go outside because in her mind, if she goes outside, she'll get the virus. This is what she she's taken away. So, you know, what we've really tried to shift, um, you know, we, we talk in a way that I think is new for us as parents and making sure that we're doing our best to educate and inform our kids. And, you know, uh, I've also had to let go a little bit. You know, I, I imagined in my head that I'm this, you know, no screen time mom. And, uh, but I'm sitting here, I have to work. My husband has to work. Uh, my daughter is currently watching My Little Pony so that she doesn't interrupt this podcast. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm trying not to um, punish myself for that. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's amazing how life has changed now. And, uh, it's hard to not be able to go to school and see friends. And, and yeah. so, you know, like everybody, you know, I, I always say I can't complain. I'm employed. My family's healthy. Um, and so, you know, we, we try to explain that to her as well, that we're very fortunate. But those fears, I mean, I remember duck and cover when I went to, where we thought you get on your desk and the nuclear bomb will protect, will, will not hurt you. I mean, it was terrifying. I can imagine what, what a five-year-old would think today. It's got to be scarring uh, right. that we have got a lot more to deal with in this, uh, once this is even over. So, Right. I see it come out in her play, right? She takes care of her her baby dolls who've gotten sick, wow. and trying to like think about the fact that you can get better, that I think that's helpful to her. That's interesting. And that's probably what we're kind of doing with your shows and things like that. You're helping in terms of making feel people feel safer, at least with knowledge. Um, you know, that's I, great... I hope so. I mean, I, I hope that we're also giving something to people that they enjoy watching or they feel like they're, you know, excited to see and, um, but look, everyone's got so much to think about and worry about. Um, so, yeah. Well, I'm just glad you're safe and everything's good. And uh, love to continue these conversations in the future. Your magnificent uh, voice of reason and logic, <laughs> and will help our industry go forward and evolve and uh, pivot. I guess is really the best word. Well, thank so, you. I thank love you. these conversations with you. You always, uh, you know, make me think in new ways. I just really appreciate it. It's great talking to you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on.